so our first speaker of the evening is Axel Dietrich. He's the founder of Frisch, a VR production company here in Vienna. Since 2002, he has been involved in the film and advertising industry as a VFX and motion graphic artist here in Vienna, Munich, and Barcelona. He will be sharing with us what it's like to be a VR producer, telling us some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of this job, as any other job that we have, along with some tips on how to get ready for what is to come. Please welcome Axel. So, VR is fantastic. It's amazing. It's definitely the future. We all agree on that, right? Uh, it's the best thing since the invention of the dishwasher, I would even say. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have a serious problem with VR. It's too complicated. It's really complicated. And therefore, it's very expensive. Uh, it happens very often that I'm in a meeting with a client, um, uh, we talk about a project, we, we uh, brainstorm, we, we exchange ideas, we, we really build this really nice uh, castle in the sky, right? But then in the end, when it comes uh, to talk about the numbers, uh, this all falls apart. Why? Because the costs are too high, often way too high. Sometimes I have the feeling people see me like uh, <laughs> some kind of Scrooge McDuck, right? Uh, overcharging for, for this new thing, the new fashion VR, and, and char just charging for, yeah, whatever. Uh, whatever I please, and I just swim in my, in my money. But sadly, the reality looks a bit uh, more like this, I would say. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's many reasons for that, and I want to explain that a bit today. One of the, the biggest reasons is the equipment that I need, or that we need in, in our company. Uh, starting with the, with the cameras. Like the cameras are really uh, a, a bottomless pit, uh, I would say. Um, there is no one camera that I can film a VR experience with. For example, for landscapes, I will need many cameras, uh, as many cameras I, as I can get in the, in the end, because I want to have a good resolution, I want to, um, I want to have uh, longer lenses, I want to get as many uh, pixels per information that I get in the, in the surrounding to capture a sharp and, and high quality image. When it comes to narrow environments, like the image in the, in the middle, uh, quite the opposite is the case. I want to have as little cameras as, as possible. I want to avoid seams between the, the, the images. And therefore, I need uh, stronger fish eyes and, and less cameras. Um, it's not so important if some details get lost because we have a lot of motion in these in this scenes. And speaking of motions, um, uh, of motion, if I have motion in the, in the movie, uh, in, the, in the film, like in the, in the last image, uh, I will need a lot of overlap between the images. So later on, when I join the images, uh, it's easier for me to decide where the seams are going to be. Um, <coughs> then, besides the, the cameras, I also need something to put on the camera. So I can just let the camera float. Uh, it needs to be on a tripod or on uh, some other support. Like for uh, movies in, uh, for, for uh, recordings, uh, in uh, static recordings, I need a tripod. For moving uh, stuff, I need something like a steady cam, like we tried here or we need some pole that we can hold in our hand and uh, different supports. And usually it's not the standard equipment that you get in the shop, it's usually that plus some other standard equipment plus a lot of duct tape and I don't know what. Um, it's always a custom solution. Then you also need a lot of mobile equipment, um, meaning a laptop. Uh, at least you need a laptop that you can quickly get your footage on, the, uh, on, your, on your computer and check it, you need to double check a lot. Um, and then you need to, to manage a lot of, uh, um, uh, you have a lot of managing to do because you have se separate cameras, but their images belong together and you have to keep them together and you have to preview them as soon as possible, okay? So the, um, that is a very expensive thing when you get laptops and then a lot of hard drives and, and all this stuff. Then uh, 
tech is uh, very, uh, very expensive and developing very fast. Um, basically, when you buy a new camera, then you have to wait until it finally arrives and you have it at home. And once you got it and unbox it, you see on the internet that the next generation has come out already. Um, <coughs> so you have to get uh, new tech constantly. And then uh, research becomes more and more um, complicated or more and more uh, laborious uh, because um, you have a lot of companies now um, seeing that there's money to make with, uh, with VR and they all offer the best solution to, to film in VR. And you have to do a lot of research to at least not fall into all these tourist traps, uh, and how, how we call them sometimes. Then filming is very, fil the filming process itself is very time consuming. After you get all your equipment, um, you don't just put your camera and film. No, it's, it's not done with that. Um, you're not in the, um, in on the set directly when you film usually. Uh, actually, you're, uh, when, you're, when you're filming in, um, in 360, you put the, the camera where you need it. You start record, uh, you play press record. You check all the cameras are, are filming, you check the lenses are not smudged because you always uh, grab them and, and, and uh, you always touch uh, one of the, the wide angle lenses and, and all these problems, right? And then you start recording and usually in this moment you have to <laughs> go hide somewhere behind the corner, behind the box uh, or the, the next thing that gives you visual cover. And so this means you don't see so much of the of the scene itself. It's still very hard to get some some live preview of what you're filming. Um, so uh, that that makes it very complicated to to um, to keep an overview on 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 what you're doing, and it needs a lot of preparation. Um, then one camera can fail sometimes. We know uh, we have our cameras, sometimes they don't record properly. We, we, um, it seems everything is fine. We go uh, home or to, to the office, we try to copy uh, a file and it didn't copy properly. There's some, some data error. Doesn't happen a lot of times, but it does happen. The thing is when you film with a lot of cameras, the probability that this happens rises. And I don't know the exact math behind this. It's um, it's definitely more than six times the probability. Maybe it's uh, like by the power of six, maybe someone can calculate that for me, but it feels like the power of six really. <laughs> so, um, and then as I said, you constantly have to work with new equip equipment. The um, de development is going so fast that it's not un uh, unusual that you have uh, a new equipment that you have barely tested in the office and you have to use it for, for some uh, shot or uh, for some project already. So that's another reason why you have to double check everything that you do. Hence, it takes more time again. Often um, results can't be, uh, can't be viewed directly as well. Um, sometimes you have a, a, a project where you have to uh, go from one uh, location to another really quickly and you don't have the time to, to check it. So you always have to shoot some safety footage. And then comes the post-production. So <laughs> the torture hasn't ended. Uh, post-production means you have to handle a huge amount of data again. Um, and it's a big challenge because as I explained shortly before, uh, it's a lot of gigabytes, terabytes really. And it's not just one file per image, it's really as many cameras you have um, of files per image. And you have to keep them together, you have to keep uh, the right order and you have to keep it synced and, and all this stuff, right? So um, it's, it's making things a lot more complicated. Then working resolution is at least 4K. Um, I've barely gotten used to, to work in HD. Uh, you, you can hear I've worked uh, for quite some time in this industry already. So HD is fine for me, now it's 4K. So great, another step where I have to know the, the twice the resolution at least, um, meaning four times the pixels, meaning four times the rendering time. Um, yeah, it's like that. That's what we have to deal with. Additional um, to that, we don't just um, need the, the, the software licenses that we, we already have to buy, like the, uh, I don't know, the minimum would be Adobe and Adobe Creative Suite and, and uh, at least a workstation and all this. For uh, VR production, you need additional licenses for uh, joining the images, the, the stitching process, um, and for spherical compositing. <coughs> and there's a lot of uh, fixing required in post-production. 
um, there's barely any shot that you don't have to retouch something. At least it's the, the tripod that you have to remove um, and, and work on, on the seams again between the images. And besides that, don't forget that you're not working alone on this. I mean, I, 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 don't <laughs> I, I was used to work a lot on, on, on projects just by myself uh, when I was working as a, as a freelancer. This is not possible anymore. It's, it's too, too much work, too many uh, steps, and, and it's too, too complicated. So speaking about the, the costs again, don't forget that you don't have one-man shows anymore. This is really a, a, a team effort then that you have to put in. So, um, because of all uh, this, uh, because of all these challenges, I'm really uh, very often in a, in the situation that I have to decide between um, uh, if I want to work on a on a project, although I can't really afford the the I really cover the costs, but I do uh, and I want to do it anyway, or I don't work on a project and really miss out on on building a new really meaningful maybe piece in, in, in this world that we call VR. And that really sucks, to be honest. <laughs> it's, it's really hard sometimes. And you might wonder, why, why doing this? I mean, why, why not uh, just keeping my, my um, uh, keep doing my uh, career that I had before as a motion graphics artist and, and VFX artist, when, which was fine, you know? I, I was making some, some decent money. I had my free time and, and yeah, I could spend more time with my friends and family, maybe do some sports again, right? Um, so why am I doing this? And I must say, as much as I hate this situation, um, one of the greatest things, uh, VR is really one of the greatest things um, that happened in my life, uh, in my professional life, definitely. And why is that? The main reason is I hate following rules. <laughs> I, I, it was always a problem for me. I, I don't like to someone else to tell me, okay, you have to do things like this and this and this. And VR is a new world for me to discover. It's really like the, the Wild West. I go there and I make my, my own rules, or we, we all do, all the VR producers. And um, yeah, it's a really completely new place to go there and, and, and build on top. And although I, I, I basically use the same tools that I that I used as a as a filmmaker before, like uh, cameras and and software and all this, except for some some exceptions, I I get to take these uh, tools apart and put them together together in a new way and and uh, use them as I please. And we we can we get to do things that nobody has has done before, and it's for me that's really exciting actually. And. It's really things like this. I don't know if you have seen this uh, episode of The Simpsons where uh, Homer is fixing the camera, right? <laughs> so this is a joke, right? Uh, the, the picture on the left is, is not a joke. This is uh, the accepted way how you remove a lens of a GoPro to exchange it for a, for a wide angle uh, lens. And um, I, I've, I've not seen any better way. And yeah, it seems a bit strange, uh, but yeah, I, I love doing things like this, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, VR gives me the, the, the possibility to, to, to teleport people in an instant uh, to, a, to a parallel world that I have created. And uh, for a short time, for the short time that they are, they are there, they have to live by my rules. Or maybe by no rules. Maybe there is no rules. Um, I I can decide. The, the important thing is that I can decide. And uh, maybe more important than that, um, we can we have the ability to to um, make people discover the real world as it is, uh, and allow them to to see places um, that they couldn't uh, visit with their physical bodies. And. <coughs> We can really build new grounds for for empathy, and that we actually need quite desperately right now uh, in in our world. I have the feeling, and I I think we get the the privilege of helping others and and ourselves to understand each other in a deeper and maybe more meaningful way. And the best thing of all, uh, they are not bound to to reality, and they can experience their their own phys uh, that they can uh, experience with their own physical body. So for me, the mission is clear. I I don't want to 
to create a virtual reality um, that is a place where, where we can escape to, just to, to forget about the problems that, that we humans created in, in our physical world. I want to create a place for education, uh, for inspiration, communication, and uh, ultimately transcendence. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your talk. Uh, I would be curious, <coughs> could you tell us a little bit what kind of projects you already did? Okay. Um, it's really been all, all kinds of projects uh, so far. It's, it was a lot of um, yeah, trying out things in different places. So uh, one thing that maybe most of you have seen already is uh, the Scaro uh, 360 music video. Where he's going through, it's called 80s Party, and, and uh, the, the, uh, maybe not everybody knows Skero, the, the rapper from Austria, and he made a, a music video with them. So, this is one thing. Um, another thing is uh, we, we did a project for, for Pro7. Uh, Pro7 is, uh, um, is also jumping on the, on the VR and, and 360 uh, train, right? And uh, they want to do some. Um, what do you call it, some documentaries in 360 degree. So there was one project where we went to, to China and we filmed, uh, they call it the, the poorest people, um, poor people's fireworks. And it was basically a, a, sm a small documentary of uh, I think some eight minutes uh, where we document this, this um, uh, how do you call it, ritual, <laughs> this celebration that they do. And it's uh, actually, it's, it's quite funny, they have uh, some, some uh, they, they liquefy iron with a lot of heat and they throw it to the, to the wall and, uh, it's, uh, and when it smashes back, it's, it's, uh, you see all the sparks and uh, it's a huge show. Uh, it started as a small thing and now it's a, a huge thing. And, and one thing that uh, we're going to do um, in June, and this is something that is very exciting for me, is uh, we're going to, the, to Lebanon, we're going to um, a refugee camp. This is a project that we're doing together with the uh, Wiener Zeitung and uh, also with the help of Caritas. And the idea is to, to um, first show, show uh, people, young people in, the, in these camps, uh, some places in Austria and, and s see a little bit of a, of a different place. But the main project is to record uh, some, some strong people some, some, uh, that than we are finding right now. Um, that are going to tell about their experience and their, um, but also their their future, what what they're planning uh, to do in the future, and and what they what they're expecting from their lives, no? uh, and so on. Yeah, <laughs> I hope this was just the beginning. That was a long answer. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, my question would be. Um, I think one of the biggest issues for VR and 360 uh, movies is like storytelling in VR. How do you tell stories? And there is one thing like showing a 360 environment, but uh, telling a true a story and uh, really a touching story in 360 in a one shot, for me, it's but now it's, uh, it's not possible and I've never seen anything yet uh, uh, which really proves that it's, it works. Yeah? Yeah. Do you have a concept for this and any ideas on that? It's, it is really complicated and, and uh, you and me, we are not the only ones like uh, breaking their heads about it. No, you don't say that in English, right? Kopf uh, zerbrechen, I'm trying to say. Um, <coughs> and I don't have an answer. Uh, I can't tell you what, what is going to be the, the storytelling in the future. I, I do see that something like documentaries work. Uh, you can go somewhere and, and film something authentic and, and it will be recognized uh, as authentic. And, and um, for 360 video, I think it's, uh, for, for uh, these examples, it's, it's very nice to just be in the vi environment together with someone else and listen to this person. And there is not much else of, of uh, let's say, interaction or interactivity needed to make this work. Um, there are some, some very interesting um, examples by, made by Oculus Studio, for example. And actually, this is some, some experience that you can try out in the experience corner today. There's uh, Henry. I've, I've seen uh, a, a very, very beautiful short story, uh, The Rose and I, or I and the Rose. It's like the, basically the, the Little Prince, uh, a short story from The Little Prince. And these are like first projects that give you an idea of how this can work in the future. I think we're far away from, from really m telling big stories and really have, m have found out all that is found to, to find out about VR. We are really just in the beginning. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. I hope that's enough of an answer. <laughs> Any more questions? I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> how did you decide? How did you decide to start working in VR? What was your motivation okay. besides okay. breaking cameras apart, <laughs> putting them okay. together? So, um, uh, okay. So uh, in the end, uh, I think it's uh, you're you're asking me about how what what was my real first VR experience, and that is uh, funny enough. It was uh, I was working on content before uh, really knowing that it was VR. It was uh, for for um, how do you call it like a, a, a tour a, a, um, a walkthrough through a, through a cruise ship that uh, was meant to to be view, uh, viewed in, a, in on the web browser and then you could scroll uh, through the through the image and you had like different hotspots that you could press on and then find more about uh, I don't know the swimming pool on the ship or whatever and. <coughs> Uh, so we filmed this, and I, I actually I was quite annoyed by, by um, having to do this because I thought, why, why would we film something and then give the user uh, the responsibility of the cameraman? And, and uh, it didn't make much sense for me. And then uh, we got uh, one of the DK1, uh, like the very first Oculus, and I just tried to, because it was spherical already, so let's, let's just try it on. And suddenly I was there, and... and it, it was like uh, like this. I, I I knew this is where I have to invest my time in. It was this moment really where I decided. Right. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, me again. Uh, <laughs> I think one of the biggest problem right now is uh, 360 video is not immersive because it's like uh, not stereoscope. Yeah. So there are professional solutions already, like the uh, like the Ozo. Mm -hmm. um, are you are you going to the Ozo market? Are you buying the Ozo? Are you working with it? How are you going to solve the problem of not being immersive in terms of stereoscope? So um, I think just the the the, the, the fact to, to uh, there is possibilities to make uh, videos stereoscopic, no? Uh, but you still don't have the the possibility to to move around, no? This, this is like the another step. Um, I've seen some examples of, of stereoscopic videos that work really nice when you have objects really close and, and that's, that's interesting to, to, to view. Um, the, the next step would be uh, yeah, to, to really be able to, to walk around in an environment, in something that is, that is uh, happening around. Um, for yeah, the, I, I'm, um, I'm sure that this is going to, to come, this is going to be developed. And uh, for sure, there is going to be uh, things that you can do with it. For, for now, it's uh, a bit too far in the future to, to really, uh, for, for me as a, as a producer, and, and that I have to work for money, I can't uh, really spend so much in research, so much effort in research. So for me, as a, as a producer, it's not that interesting yet. Uh, this is going to happen in like three to four or five years, I think, that we will we will invest more in this technology as well. Um, yeah, did that answer your question somehow? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, okay. one more question if you want, otherwise Axel will be around and you can grab him afterwards, yeah. either here or at Fry. <laughs> and, okay. okay? Okay, no more then questions. Thank no you very much. Thanks. <laughs>